Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a woman booking a bicycle tour over the phone. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Global Bicycle Tours, may I help you? Yes, thank you. I'd like to sign up for a bicycle tour. Which tour were you interested in? We have the River Valley Tour coming up in June and the Mountain Tour in July. The River Valley Tour is in June. I thought it was in May. It actually takes place the first week of June. Oh, I see. Well, I can still do that. The River Valley Tour is the one I want. Splendid. Just let me take your information. May I have your name, please? Carla Schmidt. That's Carla with a K, not a C. K-A-R-L-A. -A. Thank you, Ms. Schmidt. Address? Do you need a street address, or can I give you my post office box? A post office box is fine. It's P.O. Box 257. Manchester. Thank you. OK, next. Will you be bringing your own bicycle, or do you want to rent one from us? I'll bring my own. Excellent. Now, we provide all the meals, so we need to know if you have any dietary restrictions. I don't think so. What do you mean? I mean if there's any food you can't eat. Some people have food allergies or are vegetarian or have to avoid dairy products. Things like that. Oh, I see. Well, yes, I'm a vegetarian. I never eat meat. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. All right, I'll make a note of that. Now, the total cost of the tour is $750. That much? The price includes everything. Food, hotel, transportation, everything. Everything? Yes, everything. The only other thing is you'll want to tip the tour guide. We usually recommend 5% of the total tour cost. A 5% tip? I guess that's reasonable. In order to reserve your space on the tour, I'll need a 30% deposit. Do you need that right away? We generally ask for the deposit at least four weeks before the tour begins. The River Valley tour begins, let me see, six weeks from now. So you'll need to pay the deposit in two weeks. I think I can do that. I wonder if you could tell me something. How will our luggage be transported? Do we carry it on our bicycles? No, you leave that to us. We have a van that carries your luggage from hotel to hotel each day, so you don't have to worry about it. Great. I have a luggage rack for my bike, but I guess I won't have to bring that. No, you won't. But there are a few items we recommend that you bring. We can't control the weather, so you should bring a raincoat or rain gear. Yes, that's a good idea. And I should have my own spare tyre too, shouldn't I? Actually, you don't need that, as our guide always carries some. And of course, you won't need maps either since our guide has the route all planned. What about a water bottle? I'll need that, won't I? Yes, you should definitely have a water bottle. A camera would be a good idea too, since that tour goes through some very scenic areas. I have a guidebook of that area. I wonder if I should bring it along. We don't recommend guidebooks. It would just be extra when the tour guide knows a great deal about the area. Yes, I see. Is there anything else I need to know? I think we've covered the important points. I'll send you a tour brochure, and you can call again if you have any questions. Thank you very much. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one.
Part 2 You will hear a tour of a newly renovated health club. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions 11 to 15. Thank you all for coming to see the new renovations to the Hartford Health Club. I know you'll be as pleased as I am to see the wonderful results of our months of hard work to improve the club and bring you the best facilities ever. We'll begin in here with the swimming pool. You'll notice the new colour of the adult pool, a lovely cool green. Now walk over here and look at the children's pool. It's the same green, but as you see, with brightly coloured sea creatures painted everywhere. Both of the pools needed painting, not only for maintenance, but I think the new colour greatly improves the atmosphere of this part of the club. Next, let's take a look at the locker rooms. Don't worry, there's no one using them just now. Doesn't it feel roomy in here? We've expanded both the men's and women's locker rooms, so now they'll be much more comfortable to use. There are bigger lockers, a good deal more room in the dressing area, and more places to store extra towels and equipment. Be careful as you walk through here. The floor's just been polished and may be a bit slippery. Let's go up to the exercise room next. Here, you'll notice a new floor. Walk on it. Doesn't that feel comfortable? It's a special material, softer than the old floor, an ideal surface for jogging and, ex jogging and exercising. They had to move all the exercise equipment out while they were working on the floor, but don't worry. It will be brought back in before the end of today. Let's step outside now and look at the tennis courts. We haven't done a great deal here except to the equipment. We replaced all the nets and the ball throwing machine, otherwise everything is the same as it was before. Let's walk down this hallway and here we are at the club store in its new location. We thought here by the entrance was a better place for it than where it used to be by the swimming pool. But it still has all the same items for sale, sports equipment and clothes in the club colours. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. We're excited about the upcoming activities and events to take place in our newly renovated club. Now that the pools are ready for use again, swimming lessons will begin tomorrow for both adults and children. If you haven't signed up yet, you can stop by the office before you leave today and put your name on the list. If you're a tennis player, you'll be interested to hear about the tennis competition coming up on Wednesday. Players from different clubs all over the region will be participating. If you'd like to watch the event, tickets are available in the office. Also, I want to be sure you all know you're invited to our club party coming up next weekend. We're celebrating the completion of the renovation work and we have a lot to celebrate. The entire renovation project was finished in just nine months. That's three months less than the 12 months we'd originally planned on. We're proud of that and proud that we came in under budget too. too. Because we've had such good results with this project, we're already planning the next one. We already have two indoor pools and next year we plan to install an outdoor pool right next to the tennis courts. Details of these plans will be made available to all club members soon. All right, I think we've covered just about everything. Are there any questions? That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear two urban planning students, called Carla and Rob, discussing their presentation on cities built by the sea, following instructions from their tutor. 
First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. OK, so what I'd like you to do now is to talk to your partner about your presentations on urban planning. You should have done most of the reading now, so I'd like you to share your ideas and talk about the structure of your presentation and what you need to do next. OK, Rob, I'm glad we chose quite a specific topic. Cities built next to the sea. It made it much easier to find relevant information. Yeah, and cities are growing so quickly. I mean, we know that more than half the world's population lives in cities now. Yeah, though that's all cities, not just ones on the coast. But most of the biggest cities are actually built by the sea. I'd not realised that before. Nor me. And what's more, a lot of them are built at places where rivers come out into the sea, but apparently this can be a problem. Why? Well, as the city expands, agriculture and industry tend to spread further inland along the rivers, and so agriculture moves even further inland up the river. That's not necessarily a problem, except it means more and more pollutants are discharged into the rivers. So these are brought downstream to the cities? Right. Did you read that article about Miami on the east coast of the USA? No. Well, apparently back in the 1950s, they built channels to drain away the water in case of flooding. Sounds sensible. Yeah, they spent quite a lot of money on them, but what they didn't take into account was global warming. So they built the drainage channels too close to sea level, and now sea levels are rising, they're more or less useless. If there's a lot of rain, the water can't run away. There's nowhere for it to go. The whole design was faulty. So what are the authorities doing about it now? I don't know. I did read that they're aiming to stop disposing of wastewater into the ocean over the next ten years. But that won't help with flood prevention now, will it? No, really, they just need to find the money for something to replace the drainage channels in order to protect against flooding now. But in the long term, they need to consider the whole ecosystem. Right. Really, though, coastal cities can't deal with their problems on their own, can they? I mean, they've got to start acting together at an international level instead of just doing their own thing. Absolutely. The thing is, everyone knows what the problems are and environmentalists have a pretty good idea of what we should be doing about them, so they should be able to work together to some extent. But it's going to be a long time before countries come to a decision on what principles they're prepared to abide by. Yeah, if they ever do. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. So, I think we've probably got enough for our presentation. It's only 15 minutes. OK, so I suppose we'll begin with some general historical background about why coastal cities were established. But we don't want to spend too long on that. The other students will already know a bit about it. It's all to do with communications and so on. Yes. We should mention some geographical factors, uh, things like wetlands and river estuaries and coastal erosion and so on. We could have some maps of different cities with these features marked. On a handout, you mean? Or some slides everyone can see? Yeah, that'd be better. It'd be good to go into past mistakes in a bit more detail. 
Did you read that case study of the problems there were in New Orleans with flooding a few years ago? Yes. We could use that as the basis for that part of the talk. I don't think the other students will have read it, but they'll remember hearing about the flooding at the time. Hmm, OK. So that's probably enough background. So then we'll go on to talk about what action's been taken to deal with the problems of coastal cities. OK. What else do we need to talk about? Maybe something on future risks, looking more at the long term if populations continue to grow? Yeah. We'll need to do a bit of work there. I haven't got much information, have you? No, we'll need to look at some websites. Shouldn't take too long. OK. And I think we should end by talking about international implications. Maybe we could ask people in the audience. We've got people from quite a lot of different places. That'd be interesting, if we have time, yes. So now, should we go on? That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You will hear part of a student presentation about the variety of different species that live in the world's oceans. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. I've been looking at ocean biodiversity, that's the diversity of species that live in the world's oceans. About 20 years ago, biologists developed the idea of what they called biodiversity hotspots. These are the areas which have the greatest mixture of species. So one example is Madagascar. These hotspots are significant because they allow us to locate key areas for focusing efforts at conservation. Biologists can identify hotspots on land fairly easily, but until recently, very little was known about species distribution and diversity in the oceans, and no one even knew if hotspots existed there. Then a Canadian biologist called Boris Worm did some research in 2005 on data on ocean species that he got from the fishing industry. Worm located five hotspots for large ocean predators, like sharks, and looked at what they had in common. The main thing he'd expected to find was that they had very high concentrations of food, but to his surprise, that was only true for four of the hotspots. The remaining hotspot was quite badly off in that regard. But what he did find was that in all cases, the water at the surface of the ocean had relatively high temperatures, even when it was cool at greater depths. So, this seemed to be a factor in supporting a diverse range of these large predators. However, this wasn't enough on its own, because he also found that the water needed to have enough oxygen in it. 
so these two factors seemed necessary to support the high metabolic rate of these large fish. A couple of years later, in 2007, a researcher called Lisa Balance, who was working in California, also started looking for ocean hotspots, but not for fish. What she was interested in was marine mammals, things like seals. And she found three places in the oceans which were hotspots, and what these had in common was that these hotspots were all located at boundaries between ocean currents. And this seems to be the sort of place that has lots of the plankton that some of these species feed on. So now people who want to protect the species that are endangered need to get as much information as possible. For example, there's an international project called the Census of Marine Life. They've been surveying oceans all over the world, including the Arctic. One thing they found there, which stunned other researchers, was that there were large numbers of species which live below the ice, sometimes under a layer up to 20 metres thick. Some of these species had never been seen before. They've even found species of octopus living in these conditions. And other scientists working on the same project, but researching very different habitats on the ocean floor, have found large numbers of species congregating around volcanoes, attracted to them by the warmth and nutrients there. However, biologists still don't know how serious the threat to their survival is for each individual species. So a body called the Global Marine Species Assessment is now creating a list of endangered species on land so they consider things like the size of the population, how many members of one species there are in a particular place, and then they look at their distribution in geographical terms, although this is quite difficult when you're looking at fish because they're so mobile, and then thirdly they calculate the rate at which the decline of the species is happening. So far only 1,500 species have been assessed but they want to increase this figure to 20,000. For each one they assess, they use the data they collect on that species to produce a map showing its distribution. Ultimately, they will be able to use these to figure out not only where most species are located, but also where they are most threatened. So, finally, what can be done to retain the diversity of species in the world's oceans? Firstly, we need to set up more reserves in our oceans, places where marine species are protected. We have some, but not enough. In addition, to preserve species such as leatherback turtles, which live out in the high seas but have their nesting sites on the American coast, we need to create corridors for migration, so they can get from one area to another safely. As well as this, action needs to be taken to lower the levels of fishing quotas to prevent overfishing of endangered species. And finally, there's the problem of bycatch. This refers to the catching of unwanted fish by fishing boats. They're returned to the sea, but they're often dead or dying. If these commercial fishing boats used equipment which was more selective so that only the fish wanted for consumption were caught, this problem could be overcome. OK, so does anyone have any questions uh, about... That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.
Elevate your writing. Mastering grammar and spelling like a pro. Polishing your grammar and spelling isn't just about avoiding red squiggles in your document. It's about communicating with clarity, confidence, and professionalism. Whether you're crafting emails, reports, or presentations, impeccable written communication is crucial for success. Here are some pro tips to refine your writing skills. Grammar. Befriend the basics. Start by brushing up on fundamental grammar rules, like subject-verb agreement, comma usage and pronoun tense. Numerous online resources and grammar guides offer clear explanations and examples. Tame the tricky. Focus on mastering commonly confused concepts, like it's it's, they're they're they're, and who whom. Understanding the nuances of these words will elevate your writing instantly. Sharpen your sentence structure. Pay attention to how well-constructed sentences flow and convey meaning effectively. Analyze the sentence structure of clear and concise writing to emulate its strengths. Proofread like a hawk. Don't rely solely on spell checkers. Develop a keen eye for spotting grammatical errors by reading your work aloud and slowly. Spelling. Embrace the power of reading. Immerse yourself in well-written books and articles. The more you're exposed to correct spelling, the more it becomes ingrained in your memory. Befriend the dictionary. Keep a physical or online dictionary handy for quick reference and to learn the correct spelling of unfamiliar words. Conquer your demons. Create a personalized list of words you frequently misspell and practice them regularly. Use mnemonic devices or flashcards to make learning more engaging. Etymology is your friend. Understanding the origin and history of words can help you remember their spelling. For example, knowing that necessary comes from the Latin necess, meaning needful, can help you recall the double S. Pro-Polish. Seek feedback. Don't be afraid to ask a trusted colleague, mentor or editor to review your writing and provide constructive feedback. Embrace online tools. Utilize online grammar and style checkers as helpful guides. But remember, they're not foolproof. Always double-check their suggestions with your own knowledge. Read aloud. Reading your work aloud can help you catch awkward phrasing, grammatical errors, and inconsistencies in tone or flow. Practice makes progress. The more you write, the more comfortable and confident you'll become with proper grammar and spelling. Make writing a consistent habit, even if it's just for short periods daily. Remember, refining your writing skills is an ongoing journey. Be patient with yourself, celebrate your progress, and don't be discouraged by a